after Jesus departed from his disciples physically, there was one man who was known to be persecuting the Christians at that time, the followers of Christ. So this man, it is said that he was himself traveling around in different parts of the region and he was trying to dig out and flush out these, these Christian groups. And uh, it is said that on one of these occasions he was riding uh, a, a, and uh, a blinding light s appeared out of nowhere. And he, he was so struck by that, he fell off his horse. And he heard a voice that said inside him, Why are you persecuting my people? You see? And then he experienced a tremendous change in his, 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 his whole persona. Everything changed. And he became known as Paul. And for many people, he became the great evangelist. He converted altogether and began to preach and to share the message of Jesus. Although in his own lifetime he had never met Jesus uh, physically, personally, but he became a very well-known evangelist, traveling around all of the region, preaching in the, in the name of Jesus Christ. And that gave, birth, that gave rise to what was called Pauline Christianity. It was the, the voice of Paul. So after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's Acts and Corinthians, Ephesians, uh, uh, all of these Bible, all these other books were joined to the four Gospels. But from the four Gospels, there was, there was in the film yesterday, and so none of what Paul would have written was included in in the story of Jesus. In fact, most of the the account of Jesus' life was was largely overlooked. It was not because there are so many stories there. So what we saw yesterday was a selection. But in one, in one particular feature, it had a member of the Sinedrin, who was a very high up uh, member of the, of the spiritual authority in Israel at the time, of the Jews. And they felt in, in a strong conflict with themselves and the message that Jesus was speaking, because he was challenging them, that they were simply expressing a kind of religiousness, but lacking the real heart. And he confronted them and exposed them so many times. And so they developed a dislike for him to the extent that they really wanted to get rid of him, in fact, because he was constantly putting a light on them. He said that you study the scriptures so well, you know, you sieve out like a flea and you swallow a camel at the same time. So he's saying that you're paying so much attention to details, but at the same time you're, you're making such huge mistakes. So he's saying, so somehow he was not your favorite. You know? Though they were largely as a people expecting the return of a, a mighty prophet king of the caliber of Elijah the prophet and a mixture of maybe of Elijah and someone like King David or Solomon. And as is always the case, from then until now, that life never shows itself to suit your expectations. Because while they were ex ex expecting a king, a, war, a great mighty prophet king to come back and to free them from the rule of the Roman Empire, Jesus came on a donkey. <laughs> and I said, what? I mean, you can't be this guy. So here again it was a case of what the people thought. This is what we need, and what God sent. And whoa, I don't think we need you. So all these kind of contradictions and and so on, they they seem to always emerge, where the human mind uh, meets the divine will. And right there, just like when the hot air in a room touches the touches a sheet of glass and the other side is cold, condensation come right there. This is the condensation that happens when man's will come up against God's will. So one member of the Sanhedrin actually had some secret admiration among other beings in the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling one the ruling. There was a Sanhedrin, 
the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and so on, and, and the members of the Sanhedrin. And so he was secretly listening to Jesus and felt the power of his words inside his own heart. And so one night he slipped out from the usual group and paid a visit to try and find Jesus and to have a one-to-one -one with him. So this was arranged, and he met Jesus, and he said to Jesus, you know, Jesus said to him, actually, a man has to be born again in order to reach or to experience the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and these are they're kind of pundits. He could not understand. He took the words in a very literal way. He says, "Must a man re-enter the womb of his mother? What are you speaking?" Of? Mm. Jesus himself said to him, like, "Nicodemus, come on." Mm. Yeah. <laughs> he said, "Flesh gives birth to flesh, and spirit gives birth to spirit." And he told him, "Feel the wind. Notice the wind. You don't know where it's coming from." Or where it is going, and such is the nature of one who is born of the Spirit, what it means. Unpredictable. You must be born again before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. What is this born again? Now Christianity has coined the phrase now. But it is not limited by Christian thinking what it means. See, each human being, in order to be born again, has to die to themselves to really experience who we truly are, in spite of our conditioning. Baptism also was a kind of physical metaphor for this. A symbol for this, that when you went down in the water, you died, you drowned in God, and you left the past there. And when you came up, you are resurrected, and you are new again. And here also, when you are here, with the pointers and the messages and the encouragement and the experiences and the exercises. What have they done within you? But to get you to die to what you are not and to awaken to what you can never not be and to be conscious of this. And it isn't it is a change, it's not an upgrading of your person. It is the waking out of the sleep of personhood into timelessness. Who amongst us know this? Who knows this? I'm asking you now. Who knows this as experience? Why is your hand not up? You see, it cannot merely be what we think. It is experienced inside you. The whole person cannot be found when the question, Who am I? is is asked, you know, and one searches for the base and the root of one being. It is not presenting a person, and yet you have the experience of fully being. But descriptions are not easy to put. You 
and this born again -ness. your intuitive powers are released they are expanding they are not bound up your life becomes uh, more expressed as a form of spontaneity because it is freed from the trappings of a fearful mind or a life lived governed by the persona life is fresh each day every moment it is fresh you're not joining up the dots you did not put any dots there except the dots of your own projection which is of a person and if you are simply trying to fulfill your projections then you're preventing yourself from fully entering the ocean of your own existence something in us a great power is always there to encourage you in the spirit and the vibration of truth where there's just a natural trust emerging to sometimes step forward even with eyes closed if that is the need of the moment so you are called here to be born again and no one will look back and feel that they have lost anything precious and so great confidence comes in the heart to open up more fully to put everything in the fire which is the invitation to complete liberation because you will not go there just on words alone it has to be that your heart is set on fire something inside us has gone through that that burning portal and emerge with some with a power and a strength but not with pride not with specialness perhaps with gratitude and a confidence that if every being should collectively together or apart reject you you will not fall because you stand in a power that cannot be broken you must claim this power not just as a mental thing i claim this power claim this power but pay attention because all the exercises all the the exchanges the encounters the discourses everything points you again hmm? to simply pay attention to that which is ever present within yourself that is what is in there there will come a time that everything that you read whether it's in the bible or in the bhagavad gita or the ribu gita or the ashtavaka gita or or in the Guru Granth Sahib or in the Quran will correspond with your life's pulse and there's a strange thing that the scriptures written and pressed in solid ink will change in the presence of your reading do you notice that as your understanding increases the bible changes in front of you the words change yeah not to tell you what to do but to confirm what you are when you are the person it feels is telling you what to do when you are the self the being 
It confirms what you are. If you don't feel this conviction inside yourself that you are born again, at least you must be pregnant <laughs> with your own self. Otherwise, you could not be here. This is the delivery room, the maternity wing. Someone who is pregnant, their whole metabolism works in a different way. Something else is moving there. That something is inside each one. The devil would like you to think differently, to feel isolated, whereby you can feel rejection and, and fear, and all these things can fall upon you. But here you are encouraged to keep looking and to be confirmed. And if you have come to the place where the recognition is there of the unchanging, be one with the unchanging. It is not a fantasy. You would know, and this is why when we, through exercising, you come to that place, I question you, <coughs> to see if we are making things up, or living in imagination, or spiritual fantasy. And the power of your response confirms that you are expressing through a living seeing, a living being. Because I have not heard anybody saying, I think, and it seems like. You speak with a conviction and the authority of your own experience. So remain conscious in that. Stay with it. <coughs> Love it. In fact, it is natural, because it alone is serving you without betrayal. So everything that we think with the human mind somehow betrays us. And it is good, so that you will place your heart and your attention on that which is imperishable, on that which is without desire. The result of your satsang amounts to a kind of a scooping out, an emptying out of the sense of the content of a person, and you are replaced with emptiness, like emptiness walking in the form of a human being. Heard from the outside, it does not sound very delightful, but experienced from within, it is much less. Therefore, it is not important that the world hears about you through your own mouth, because even if yours was a tongueless realization, 
you would communicate much more eloquently and completely just by being. It's like through the mind and the senses you perceive. No? And you can hear the sound, like we hear the sound of your footsteps. You perceive all these things. It's so momentary. You don't you do not need to identify yourself. Automatically, spontaneously, intuitively know you're here. But you're not these sounds or anything that is brought to you by the senses or the mind. So what are you? Such an immense lightness. Like space, more than space, because even space you can perceive. What can you be when even space, the most subtle of phenomena, is itself perceivable in you? Who are you then? Are you a a waiting to become? Do you make any preparation to perceive? Even the act and the function of perception is occurring totally spontaneously to you. Did you have to get ready to perceive? Mm-hmm. However quick any manifest sensation or thought arises, Are you not already there? Have you moved? Mm. So just out of habit, a reflex happens, and attention goes back towards the habitual place, which is the person place. But now that is watched also, not claimed. And how shallow are the roots of that? Why to worry? It is also only a passing cloud. But your own self, you are not passing, not drifting. Not visiting, not leaving. Can you not confirm this? Yes. Yes. When you can confirm this, you are already reborn in the truth. (laughs) Because it means that you are in dialogue with the truth. You are satsang manifest. And you are before satsang. So just keep looking until your looking is becoming sweeter and sweeter. Because it is not a chore, it is not a hardship. It confirms itself more and more. Why should you doubt? Where is the place for doubt? It is just an old habit. Where is even the place for belief? You have a, a female's body. Do you say, I believe I'm a woman? No, you take it for granted.
get used to the fact that when certain sensations, especially those that have formed some impression in consciousness, when they arise, they seem to mesmerize something. And you believe that while they are present in their highest pulsation, there is a certain reality to them. It is as though we become somehow easily involved. You believe in their reality. And yet, when they are gone, there is no value in them. Therefore, it is good to confirm and to meditate on that which you know, to marinate in it. So, in the moment when the mind is pulsating with delusion, you are not in a state of hypnosis. Quickly, you can discard. And it will be nothing for you. Thank you. Thank you.